So quickly, a bit about myself and my background, and then we'll jump right into the presentation as well. Uh, so my name is Chen. Uh, I run Plasi Nawal. And to give you some context on what this is and why I'm doing the workshops that I'm doing, uh, right now, the workshops run pretty much every single week. So today's session is on storytelling. Next week, uh, I'm actually pre preparing a very interesting session on overcoming the imposter syndrome and building confidence. So I think uh, the, the idea is you're starting to see that a lot of my workshops tend to center around soft skills. Uh, I do this because I'm personally passionate about education, but I find that the education system, the traditional one, tends to focus a lot on hard skills. Uh, and a lot of people graduate, they have you know, fancy degrees, but they don't really know what they want to do in life. So my idea is I want to be able to change education to include more of these transferable skills to help people better discover themselves, better understand themselves so that they can move forward and hopefully find a job that they, you know, are more passionate about or start a company that they are, you know, really uh, excited about. So that's a bit about myself and Kasi Nawal. Uh, I won't spend too much time berating the point, but I spent from, I spent the last about five years or so working primarily with entrepreneurs. So if I do chime in at any time to give any insight, do know that the perspective that I come from is mostly from the perspective of an uh, entrepreneur. So that's kind of a bit of my, about my background. Uh, Dr. Renee Jacobs is here as our speaker today. Uh, so she's very interesting. She's actually the um, director of speak, speakers, uh, director of speaking coach, is it? Speaker training, <laughs> director of speaker training. Yes, director of speaker get training. get inspired talks, yeah. Yes. I get inspired for talks. And I, I met um, Renee when I was out at a Vancouver Business Network event. Uh, and that's one of the events that uh, Roger Killen runs. So Roger Killen runs Get Inspired Talks. Uh, and previously, Roger used to be the, the organizer for uh, TEDx Stanley Park. Uh, so I was listening to one of Renee's talks about storytelling. I thought she had some really great and interesting insights to share. So she's a, you know, she comes from a very interesting background. She, where she moved from being a, a, an actual doctor, uh, and now she actually does speaker training and helps people you know, tell better stories of themselves. So maybe I'll transition to you, Renee, to do a better job introducing yourself and to jump into the presentation. <laughs> I'll just jump right in. Um, let me share my screen. And if you'll just confirm, How's it look? Have I got the right screen up? Yep. Okay. So the most, most successful business people improve their storytelling skills for a reason. There's nothing in the world that's quite like a well-told story to attract interest and to gain engagement and to really connect at the level of emotions. People in sales, people, people successful in business know that all decision making is emotional. And that ability to connect is how we earn that, I know you, I like you, I trust you. And many people would say that trust is a currency that fast tracks your business relationships. So I see business people who struggle, especially in the highly credentialed profession, professions like, like Chen was talking about, engineers, accountants, or people like me, I'm a retired eye doctor, and I sold my practice in 2008, and I struggled. I had these big visions that I was going to move into consulting. I was going to do that because I'd gained recognition for staff training. I'd gained recognition writing for Eye Care Professional magazine. And my husband thought it'd be great if we could move to Australia. And so I had a successful business and I thought, here's what I'll do. I'll sell my business and I'll move into consulting. And I will get clients by speaking at international continuing education events. That was the idea. And it turns out talking to patients in the exam room is a lot like talking to doctors about their business, but giving continuing education courses as a way to get clients is an entirely different skill set. And I absolutely flopped. And I flopped for exactly the reasons that Chen already said. I was raised to give statistics and facts 
And the more that I did not connect with those soft skills, I know you, I like you, I trust you, the more opportunity. I mean, I spoke at International Vision Expo in New York City at the Javits Center, over 300 doctors for continuing education there to hear what I had to say. And I walked away with not one single client. And a lot of us suffer that way. I see business people do that because when you get into high stakes conversations, especially in business, it's kind of a two part proposition. On the one hand, you want to be a content expert, but to be successful in business, you need that other thing, the charisma, the stuff that makes people feel like they know you, they like you, they trust you. And there's nothing quite like stories to do that. Uh, today, I say that I, I laugh at my past and I think of it as bittersweet tears. I think of what I didn't know that I didn't know. And when I failed, I thought I wasn't giving enough stats or enough information. So I got worse before I got better. And if you think of this as money lost, how much money and time did I lose of my life because I didn't have those skills and I didn't know that was the missing link. I never, never, never want that to happen to you. And I believe that's probably why you're here today. So today I'm going to share a, a process. It's um, two roles and a three-step system. And this is exactly what I teach when I help business people through storytelling in my online class, my business storytelling masterclass, how to craft and tell at least 15 engaging stories in 47 days or less. And this is the process that we'll talk about today. First, as an editor, it's a three-step process. As an editor, first choose the right story. And we'll talk about what is the right story. Next, edit the right story and then tell the right story. Now, as Chen said, I'm open to questions. And before I get too far along, I, Chen, if you would help me, if everyone here go down and look and locate the chat and tell me Today, if you improve your storytelling skills, if you get better at this thing, what is the top of your mind that will change? What business relationship right now would you like to see change? Are you writing an ebook? Are you doing social media posts? Do you have an upcoming client meeting? When you get better at really connecting to the heart, what is top of the mind right now? And Chen, if you could just read out kind of the full variety of what people share. Sure thing. For myself, probably um, I'm working more on the storytelling on the personal side. So just finding to, trying to find ways to be more funny, I guess, so that when I hang out with friends and whatnot, I'm a bit more engaging, more interesting to be around them. Any other ones? Uh, Rebecca is asking quickly, is this not a story how, not a workshop about actual storytelling for fiction writers? Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I, I might have not clarified as well in the, in the event description, but I guess, um, do you think, Renee, if any of the stuff that you'll be talking about applies to that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, Daniel is saying podcast and blog. Alvin is saying create more engaging educational content. Rachel, increase uh, social media engagement. Uh, Dakota is to be respected by other professionals. Um, beyond my young students whom I can really connect with. Uh, Karen is, to looking, is looking to write an AI blog. Derma is to reach partnerships for business. Maria to express a new business culture. Nice. Yeah, there are so many places now in the digital world where you can really use storytelling skills, presentations in addition to the one-on-one -on -one work that we do. Do you want me to keep reading? Uh, nope, we're good right there. I'm 
moving to my next slide. Here we go. When you choose the right story, how do you choose the right story? There are three things to keep in mind. One of them is top of the mind. What is it that you want people to know? When I work with speakers, people who do keynote speakers, or business presentations at conferences, they usually have something they want to communicate, something they want people to know about them and the work that they do. So that's top of the mind. Second thing to keep in mind as the editor, before you, before you tell your story, there are these things you think about. Second, make it personal. So many speakers say, I've got this thing that'll change the world. But if the people who are listening don't agree, that's not what they came to hear, then they won't be very interested. So you want to be sure your story has something in it that the listener, that the audience wants and craves. Next, be charismatic. Bring your full personality so you choose a story that you know you can tell well and when you relive it, you can bring it to life. And then you get bonus points for being entertaining. So that's step one, is choosing the right story. The next step is to edit the right story. And this is a strategy that everyone here can use. Think of it, the first, first strategy is what I call zooming in. Like if you imagine big Google Earth, and then you start zooming in and you zoom in until you're in your house, and then you zoom in until you're in your kitchen. Where is a place and a time with all of the details of a scene when you made a decision, a turning point? You want something, you have emotions around that thing you want, and it leads to a decision and an action. And emotions, what we feel as we struggle in those turning points in our life, they make the best stories. Once you've edited your story, you think of crafting your story, you've got the scene and the characters and you zoom into that moment where you're making decisions. That's the editing that goes in. When I do the storytelling masterclass, I have 20 strategies that you can use to take the right story and make it a more interesting and engaging story. Then you practice telling your story because if it works for you, you'll see people light up. And if they love your story, then you're ready to take it public. You can use it in presentations. And there are so many places to test your story. You can do it at dinner with friends or with a business person in the car. And, and you don't have to say, let me tell you a story. You just kind of lean into the topic. And when you start to tell, notice if they light up. And if instantly it reminds them of a story in their own life, if they get very conversational, you know your story hit the mark. It's personal to them. Now, I have an example story. So think about if I'm doing exactly the things that I said. If you see that zooming in, if you see the turning point, okay? So a few years ago, Blue Hotel, downtown Vancouver. It is the dress rehearsal for TEDx Stanley Park. And I have coached four of the speakers. We have Patty Morrison there as an image consultant and I asked her, I know she's there helping the speakers pick their clothes and be ready for a stage. But, you know, I said, Patty, at the lunch break, would you mind just kind of taking a look at some of the options that I could bear? Because at the end of the day at Queen Elizabeth Theater, 2,600 people, we get a standing ovation. At the very end, the speakers and the coaches walk up on stage. So I'm only going to have a few minutes of stage time, but I'm planning what to wear. It should be pretty easy. So we're at the break, everybody's gone. It's just me and Patty in this conference room. And I've brought my clothes in, honestly, a black plastic trash bag. And Patty looks at them and she says, you know, Renee, I've seen your speakers. You give insightful 
information. You are an amazing coach. I have watched people transform. But the clothes you have, you are boring. High quality, but boring. You know, black slacks, blue sweater. And I said, well, I'm a doctor. We're kind of a conservative group of folks. Um, but I do the work I do, my expertise, that's what's important, not my clothes. Patty says, you know, this is a dress rehearsal. You're here with other speaker coaches and you are frankly underdressed. And then she said this, she said two things you should know. You're in a profession which is creative. You should look edgy, especially because people want to know if you're gonna really help them take the stage. So you're in a creative profession. When you don't dress appropriately, you look like you're not successful, like you can't afford to dress appropriately for your job. She said it's either that or number two. It might be that you just don't care. You don't care enough about your clients to put the effort in to look appropriate for your job. I felt sucker punched because I care about my speakers more than anything. I kind of thought it's better to be plain. This is their big day. It's like when you go to a wedding, you don't wear white because it's the bride's big day. I was kind of wanting to blend in the background. And Patty said, no, it's time for you to step up and change your image. So now, I pick my clothes more carefully. I actually have speaker glasses. I'm not wearing them today because I need my computer glasses to see the screen. I made quite a different effort. And the reason I'm telling that experience, sharing that with you, is because I work with a lot of people who understand they can change their work image, they can change their clothes and their style. They understand that but they think you're either a storyteller or you're not a storyteller. And just like changing your style, if you actually care about the people you communicate with, you can make an effort to learn storytelling skills, be more interesting, be more fascinating. If you care about people, that extra effort will pay off. You'll tip from being kind of logic-based into communicating with heart where decision-making happens and it'll impact and make it possible to capitalize on communication in your business relationships. Okay, that's an example story. Now let's just think it through like an evaluator. Did you notice the zooming in? Okay, so when you think of the right story, if you zoom in and set the scene, okay, so it's, where is it? It's the blue hotel, what is it? You can imagine a conference room, it's the dress rehearsal we've got. So you zoom in and then the important conversation to have is the turning point that is emotional where there's a decision to be made. The turning point, you would think it's simple. I showed up thinking, oh, she'll just tell me blue sweater, black slacks, you're good to go. And instead, she gave me a lesson that changed my life. So I have, I have a question. Um, when you think about being entertaining, and Chen alluded to this earlier, I think of entertaining as, is there a moment in the story, like watching a movie when you get lost, you stop thinking about work or emails, or there's a point where you sort of just kind of lean back and get caught up in it. To me, that's entertainment. So if you will, just honestly, like, 
like Chen said, say what you really think on a scale of zero to 10, zero being I was bored out of my mind, 10, I found that to be engaging. Uh, let me know how, how it landed on the entertainment scale. Mm -hmm. Typing into chat. Now I don't have my chat open. Chen, how did I do on my entertainment scale? Uh, eight, eight, nine, nine, eight point five, seven. Yay! <clears throat> now let's evaluate the editor side of things, and I'm going to go a little bit out of order. I tried to choose a story that would be relevant to the people in this room today. Same scale, zero. It's got nothing to do with me. Ten. Hey, I learned something I could use. How did I do? Type it into the chat. Just type a number in the chat. Jen, how did I do? 10, 10, 8, 10, 9, 3, 9. <laughs> hey, <laughs> oh, I'm feeling better. I called Patty this morning because I thought of that story in the middle of the night last night. And I have this rule that when I, the same thing, you know, that I tell people when I coach them, if you're going to talk about people and share stories. Make sure you've got their okay up front. So I, I gave her a call and I don't see all the people here today, but there's a good chance that she's come. So one is have something, number, number two was have something relevant to the listeners. And then the next thing I wanted to talk about is being charismatic. What do you type in the chat? What do you think are the qualities of charisma? Type into the chat. What do you think are qualities that make um, a presenter, a person you're talking with, feel charismatic? And Chen, can you help me out? Yeah. Uh, smiling a lot, likability, uh, open body language, talking up, owning space, smiling, eye contact, genuine passion, engaging, empathetic, facial gestures, empathy, confidence. Fantastic. Fantastic. So I think of it as three things. Power, but not power as in authoritarian strutting. It's power like you bring the person who you really truly are. You bring your personality. A lot of people feel like you park your personality at the door and you and you come out and be very teacher preacher whereas people will engage and connect and feel like they know you if you show up with your personality so personality and presence and a lot of people alluded to that if you're really attending to someone there's the eye contact and the smile and warmth a sincere caring a sincere desire to, to participate in service. So those are things to think about when you bring charisma. We talked about being entertaining. Now, the real want return on investment. The reason you tell a story, even if it's just one to 200 words, one to two minutes to engage the audience, you have messages that you want to communicate, messages that you as the speaker care about. And I actually have five of them, five takeaway points. First is storytelling is a skill that you can learn. The second is most people feel like they need stories that are the epic fail and the business success and the client success. Those are classic business stories. I told some classic business stories at the VBN meetup. If you're interested in having that video, just type into the chat your name and your email and that you want that video and I'd be happy to send that to you. I picked different stories today because my opinion is business people don't realize their daily life is full of the best stories to tell. So many people say, I don't really have anything interesting to talk about. Once you notice it's about turning points and interactions with people and that you can tell it in a way to make it fascinating, 
you discover you have all kinds of stories, a wealth of fascinating things to talk about in daily life. Number three, I, talk, I wanted to make the point that you can edit for greater effect. I showed how you zoom in, pick something that's emotional, that has decisions and actions. And I talked about tell in the present tense, use actual words. There are 20 different techniques you can use to improve your story, to make it more engaging. And you are quite capable of tipping the scales. Earn the, oh, I know you, I like you, I trust you. And that charismatic magnetism that makes people really enjoy being with you. Again, earning trust and making a real difference in your business. Now, the other thing that Patty did, because I was at that place where, okay, now I've decided to be edgy. <laughs> in the, when I was in the Air Force, I had a uniform. That was a pretty brainless way to get dressed every day, and it really worked for me. <laughs> and then when I was a doctor, it was you know black slacks and a sweater, and you just put on a lab coat. People don't expect the doctor to look edgy, but this is kind of hard, and I don't know how to do it. And Patty had a method, and that is, well, we'll go looking through stores together. I'll be with you. I'm going to teach you the basics just so I'll guide you. We'll do a little practice until you understand the basics. And then once you have the basics, you'll get independent and you'll acquire and become more and more unique and appropriate for you. That, that was the plan. That, okay. My business storytelling masterclass is exactly the same in that regard. I have a five-step storytelling system where you're guided through practice, you get help, you get all the basics, and over the course of the class, 47 days, and creating 15, crafting and, and telling 15 engaging stories over 47 days, you get enough practice to where you become independent and more and more creative and more and more uniquely you. And this is what the storytelling system looks like. First, to notice the great stories. I, I gave you two stories that most people wouldn't just go to automatically. When you start to notice what are the right stories, then get your first draft into writing. And the way we do that is you, you take your phone, first you think it through. I'm gonna zoom in, here's the decision point, here's the emotions, you think it through. And then you take your phone and make a selfie video. When people do that, they naturally do the right facial expressions and it comes out sounding like you really talk. When people sit and type a story, it usually isn't as engaging, it's not as good because we don't type, talk, and write papers the same. So we get the story the way you really talk. Then use a talk to text program to have actual words. Then we apply those strategies. Look through your script. Is there a place where you can use real words? Look through your script. Is there a place where you can bring colorful language? We have 20 things you can do as you go through your script to make it more effective. And when you have a script you like, you pull out your phone and do a new selfie using your script. Take a look at your delivery, your emotions, your charisma. And when you like it, then tell it to a test audience. In the Storytelling Masterclass, you're paired with business peers. So you hear their stories and what they're practicing and you learn about business stories, which is really cool. But then you also get practice telling your stories. And if they love your stories, if your stories are effective and they communicate the message you want to communicate, then they're ready for all those things you listed when, when we came on board earlier. Your ebook, your social media posts, your trainings with staff, your one-on-one -on -one meetings with clients and 
trying to attract business partners, investors, things like that. If you've enjoyed our experience today, you'll like my storytelling masterclass. Um, and if you want to know more about that, I've asked Chin to put information into the chat. So you can reach out to me by email uh, or in LinkedIn or take a look at the, um, the, the website. And with that, I'm open to any questions or comments or things people would like to add. Great. While we wait for questions to come in, I'll, I'll make some of my observations as well, and maybe I'll ask a few questions just to kick it off too. Okay, lovely. Um, so just uh, <clears throat> evaluating the story that you were sharing, one of the things that I noticed that uh, I found really interesting is the, the way that you would tell it in the form of a dialogue. You know, uh, she said, Patty said, I said, so the kind of exchange between there kind of puts you in the moment, I guess. That's right. Many people will say, Patty told me that I'm not dressed appropriately. One storytelling editing strategy to bring your story to life is to use actual words that people say. Because usually there's what they say, and then there's how they say it, and that will have within it what's called subtext, extra meaning behind the words. When I used Patty's actual words, you get the meaning of it, and you get the feeling of tough love. And you also hear somebody who really is an image specialist and strategist who comes with a professionalism. And that stuff gets communicated when you use actual words, actual dialogue. It's a, it's a really great editing strategy after you've, after you've identified your story, when you get ready to tell it and edit it, you take it to the next level by saying, are there places in this story where I can use actual words? That's a great observation. Um, a tip that I've learned myself is to, to pay attention and start to collect stories. Uh, so what I mean by that is sometimes you never know when you can repurpose a story for whatever you're trying to do. So if something interesting happens to you, then you just take note of it and be like, hey, that was an interesting moment. Maybe I can try to find a way to incorporate the story in some way as well. So um, that's just, just a random tip, just a random comment. You, I love that. Yeah. No, I do. I love that. And that's why I, that's one of the things I, I teach in the business storytelling masterclass, because so many people think I have a situation where I want to tell a story and then they start going through their mind of their catalog of the stories that they remember. If instead, anytime something interesting happens, emotions with a turning point, you just capture it in a journal or on in the notes on your phone, if you just capture it, then there it is in the raw form. It's not edited. You just, you grabbed the situation and the exact words and you recorded it. And then in the future, when you are thinking what story would fit, you can go back through your diary and you'll be shocked at what things match up perfectly that you never would have put together. Like I'm sure my sausage McMuffin story could be used if, if I told you all the things I, did wrong before I got it right, could be used to talk about innovation and trial and error and what happens if you're in business and you really understand social media, but you really don't understand medical billing records or, you know, there are ways you can, there are things in life that we do where, where we're, we're called upon to do trial and error. If you, if you capture your stories and you keep them and catalog them, you'll always find fascinating things that you can pair up so just, yeah, being a storyteller, knowing you're a storyteller, collecting your stories, I get long-winded. I like stories. No <laughs> um, some questions are coming in. So okay. uh, one from Dakota, how do you be your authentic self when being yourself just does not work for the people around you? For, for example, for colleagues, for friends, families, peers, or people with authority or power? I'm sorry, can you just say it one more time? I didn't get all the words. Sure. How do you be your authentic self when being yourself just does not work for the people around you. Um, more specifically, probably in the cases where you're in conversation with people uh, who have authority or power. So, you know, like colleagues in a business situation, friends, families. Yes. There's a general truism that in business, the people that will be attracted to you, the people who will want to work with you are people who believe the same things that you believe. And so part of being successful is choosing the stories that those people uh, 
uh, will gravitate toward because you have common beliefs. You always are your original authentic self if you tell stories from your own life. Where you seem false is when you look for quotes and jokes and things that are external. When you pull things from your own life, you will, you will be original and you will be authentic. What to do if you're in a situation where you, you don't feel comfortable, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I know how to answer that, but I, I appreciate what you're thinking. And if you um, wanna connect up in email, I'd be happy to, to talk privately and see if I could help sort out and be helpful. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and uh, try to answer that question too, because yeah. in, in preparing my presentation for next week on imposter syndrome, I think oh, uh, yeah. I was thinking about that question quite a bit because it's something that came up in one of our, the, the habit accountability groups that I run. Mm. So uh, what I've come to learn is that a lot of people think about the mask that they wear in front of different people. And I think we don't realize that we are all, that there is no such thing as a true authentic self we always change ourselves depending on who we're interacting with. You know, you would behave differently in front of your grandma than you would with your brother, right? So these things are, are quite normal and it happens even in a business or professional setting as well. Uh, where authenticity comes from is when you um, are behaving in ways where you exhibit behavior, where you share stories that align with your personal values. So as long as you believe in what you're sharing, as long as it aligns with your values, then I think that's where the authenticity comes from. But it's okay for you to change your, um, sort of must, so to speak, to, to suit the situation, so to speak. Yeah, when I chose my, I agree with you, when I chose my picture for charisma, I chose from that movie Shazam, because he says Shazam and then he becomes, you know. I actually am of the belief that humans are deep and wide and capable, and you really can never be anybody else. But there's a big learning curve to saying, I will embrace telling my stories. I will have the courage to be myself and live in the moment when I do my story. There's almost a, a coming out of being yourself when you embrace the idea that you're going to give it a, give it a try. And you can kind of sh you know, do your own Shazam and, and pull out that big uh, personality that really is the authentic you. You can be your big you, your best you for the situation. And it isn't fake. You're doing it to connect with someone else who you care enough about that you put effort into that conversation. There, there's a lot of growth that happens inside you when you decide you're gonna tell your stories and use them in business. Uh, another question from Ling, uh, to be a great storyteller, do I need to master my facial and body expression? So if you, what I like about the method that I do in, in the business storytelling masterclass, I have people start by thinking of the story and then pull out your phone and tell the story, tell the story like you're talking to a friend. That way I've discovered that people who sit and write the story get very mechanical but people who just tell the story to their phone, even if it's just one, one to four minutes in length, tell the story to your phone, then use talk to text. That's where you get your script. Then use editing strategies on that script. That way it comes out conversational. And it then my experience with people is they don't need a lot of coaching on facial expressions and body language because they've written something that is conversational in their own words. It doesn't feel fake. You know, when you practice it, you edit it and you put it together and then you do another retell on your phone and you watch and observe yourself, you'll start to get all of that right. It doesn't take a lot of coaching. So I don't know if that was helpful. Did I answer the question on, on point? I try to get people to be their authentic self and not get too hung up on, on here's where I touch my heart. Here's where I, <laughs> my fist, you know, if you tell your stories from your life and you capture them in their natural form, editing strategies make them more engaging. They don't make them 
not original or fake. They just make them more engaging. Um, I get very long-winded. I love <laughs> the topic of story. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, another great question from Irma. So this question I like because um, one of the, the tips that I've learned in a networking context is when you're making small talk and if you don't have a personal story, one thing you can do is you can borrow the stories of others. Uh, so her question here is related to that. It says, would it be the same if I tell a story about myself or a story of another person? Like, would it have the same power or impact? That's a lovely question. And it comes up a lot when I coach people for big stages. You know, they're doing their signature talk, they're putting it together because they want to do a TEDx and they're trying to win a general audience to come to them and get next step services. And often people want to tell someone else's story. If you want the listener to feel like they know you, they like you, they trust you, their intuition keys in when they watch you struggle with a decision. So if you're trying to get someone to feel like they know you, you tell a story where you're the protagonist. So if you're working with a client, and this is another thing, people think client stories are about the client. Really good client stories are about what it's like to work with you. The client's struggling and they have a problem and you, and you go into their feelings and the decisions they're making this is really a story about you. You care for them. You know the right thing to do. You want to put them, um, give them peace of mind. You've got strategies that you bring. You have words of counseling that you bring. So it's a client story, but it's heavy. A well-told client story is heavy on the experience of your struggle bringing that person to success. And it's really to the listener it's a story about what it's like to work with you. So the most powerful stories will be stories where you're the key actor in the decision making. If when you really want people to feel like they know you. A uh, question from Maria, is there any exercise that you can suggest for improving diction? Since English is not my first language, I noticed that you speak very calmly, slowly and pronounce correctly every word. I don't, I don't have great advice. That's what I, what I do like is this, where you tell your story to your phone and then you hear it back. And I watch people when they practice their stories, I watch them get more clear just from the self-assessment of practicing with a tool that they can observe themselves. Tim, do you have other ideas about that? Because I know you're, we're in Vancouver and we're in a place where we have many people who speak English as a second or third language. Well, English is my first language for me, so I don't have any easy tips. I do, however, carry a heavy accent, uh, maybe not as heavy as I think it is, um, but coming from Malaysia, I do have a Malaysian accent, and sometimes that does get to me, and I wonder if I'm actually communicating the right way, pronouncing the right, uh, enunciating the right way. Um, but I've come to just kind of embrace that, like, you know, who cares? <laughs> Accents kind of give you personality as well, so you don't necessarily have to cut out every single element of it. Yeah, he asked for a resource, right? People on chat might have ideas. Can they type in books they've read or videos or things they've found helpful if that's a challenge? We've got a group, big, res big resource group here. Uh, sure, and as people put that in, some of the comments here. So let's see, Raphael, how do you be a good st storyteller online? Any comments on that piece? You know, I am um, in a in a few weeks. I'm going to be at the Kitsilano meetup, talking about bringing charisma to online presentations. It's a special kind of challenge, because eye contact matters and it's it's more challenging. So first, you need great stories that are compelling. And when you say online, I don't know if you're talking about blogs and vlogs and all the different ways that we communicate, but great stories will carry themselves. But then, yeah, your ability to live in the moment and relive and bring it to life and identify what people want to know so you're relevant. That's the stuff that works. 
if I can give any of my tips on the online piece, uh, it also yeah. depends on the context online. So if it's online in a, in the form of video, um, similar to this, if you notice, uh, Renee's slides are very light on text. So your presentation is always your wingman. It's not stealing the show from you. Make sure that you are the, the limelight. Uh, so if possible, like generally I find if you're really trying to inspire people through an online talk, uh, or if you're thinking about making videos on YouTube and whatnot, uh, generally you see the best videos, the, the speaker is in full view. It's not a slide and speaker in the corner kind of thing. So that, mm -hmm. that for video type of content. Um, it's hard, yeah, it's hard to do that on Zoom because the um, yeah. user gets to pick the, the size. Hey, Chen, if you wouldn't mind, I just want to stay, say one more time, I am recording this talk. If you want to have this talk for review or to share with people at work who you think would benefit from learning some storytelling strategies, again, type your email address and the request into chat and I'll be sure to send you this one. And if you would like to see the one I did previously, I can give you the, um, the video of that one as well. I want to make sure people know about that. And also, if you can, Chen, can you put my contact details into the, yep. into the chat? Yeah. I'm struggling I, to find it. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. I, I really did it twice. I'll do it okay. again uh, okay. before we wrap up as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, so yeah, online for video, that's just a piece on, on making sure that you're front and center. Um, online for text, like if you're creating, let's say a Facebook post, social media post, um, what I find in terms of the storytelling piece, two things. So one is you have to clearly kind of call out the customer, make them the subject of the story <clears throat> so that they know like, okay, this is about a person who's similar to me. And then when you use emotion in storytelling, uh, you have to be careful about what types of emotion as well. I tend, I tend to find a lot of business owners tend to use positive emotions because they find that negative emotions tend to, um, you know, they don't want to be a Debbie Downer, so to speak, right? Yeah. But negative emotions can also make really good stories if you use it the right way. So what I find is the, the most viral type of contents that get the most shares are usually the ones where uh, they are what we call arousing emotions. Mm. So these are emotions that could be positive or negative. So on the positive side, it's, you know, adventure, excitement. Um, and then like a, an opposite of that is uh, passive emotions. So for example, like contentment, like, you know, if you talk about a success story and you talk about how your client is you know, achieving this state of uh, peaceful contentment that normally won't get as much engagement. Uh, on the negative side, what arouses would be like, you know, you, you might talk about complaint situations, right? You might get people to share what they're frustrated about. Those kind of things will, will increase sharing as well. And if you're share, uh, talking about things that are, you know, like, oh, I was, you know, this is how it is, I give up, then those kind of things won't do as well. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to scroll around to see some of the other questions. Uh, Dakota's comment, practice talking to yourself in a mirror and or in inanimate object, your pet or pretend that you're talking to a friend. Uh, you can also ask your family's friend for feedback. You can join Toastmasters. Yes. Uh, uh, someone is sharing, but I don't know what their name is here. Hi, in response to the question about accents, I taught English internationally and heard the best quote ever. An accent is a sign of strength. My accent is so strong, when speaking Spanish, so it res really resonated with me. Nice. Uh, how do you identify what is relevant for your audience? You have to know your audience. You have to know them. So when I work with business people putting their stories together, you know your, what I call a target market avatar. And if you don't know that, then the way to think of it is who are your favorite clients? Why are they your favorite clients? And what was the pain point that brought them to you? Why did they say, yes, they want to work with you? If you've got 10 of those people and you suss out, who are they? Why are they the perfect fit? And what was the pain that brought them to you? Then that's the stuff that should be in your story because that's the content that will attract other people like your best clients, the ones you want to come to you, and they will self-identify when you tell those kinds of stories. Chen, did I say that in a way that makes sense? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and, and to give an example in a business context there, 
uh, and more on the storytelling storytelling side as well is uh, when I used to work at Spring. So Spring is a social venture incubator. Mm. Uh, one of the things that we would do is we would support companies that were raising money from investors. And I, I've heard a lot of companies where they they go out to an investor pitch, and the, the logical side of them takes over, and they talk about all the stats. They talk about you know this is the problem that we have. This is the solution that we've built. But normally, I find that the entrepreneurs when they tell stories that are most engaging. They normally tell it either from a personal angle, and they try to find a way where it's actually relevant for it, for the investors in the room. And they know that they're not trying to appeal to all the investors in the room. So what they do is they do their research and they actually say, "Hey, you know what? I'm really targeting this type of investor. Who cares about the rest of the investors?" Because at the same, you know, finding investors is same, uh, similar to finding a, a customer as well. So then they would uh, really tailor the the story around that. So one example was. Um, there was this uh, great entrepreneur, he, he created this wearable device. Uh, and what he would do is it would actually uh, track body positioning and um, moisture. And basically, I'm kind of giving you the context and I'll tell you how he told the story as well. So what it does is it's for older people and it helps them um, if they are going through you know, incontinence. So if they lose bowel control, if they pee or poop themselves and they're in a nursing care home, it helps alert their caregivers to you know, shift them from the bed so that they don't get bed sores or you know, change their adult diapers and whatnot. So the way he told the story was very interesting. He didn't do what I just did. So you know, if you are the logical side, that's what you would do. You give the logical explanation there. Uh, but the way that he told the story, he said, hey, um, I'm doing this business because I, my father-in-law, he is 80 years old, he's in a, in a senior care home. And one of the common problems that he often gets is uh, he will develop this really terrible bed sores all over his body. And that happens because when something happens, like let's say if he pees himself uh, or if he poops it and his caregiver isn't aware of it, then these type of things will, will develop, right? Bacteria will grow or whatnot. So I've developed this device and this is how it actually addresses that. So he's actually telling a very relatable story and it will appeal to investors who have parents who are a bit older or who themselves are a bit older and worry that this might happen to them in the future as well. So that's and the what a difference. Everybody. I mean, even when you just gave it two ways, the logic way and with a bit of story, the story, the story touches me in a different place. And he's telling it he, from the way you told that story. So you know, so I'm getting it like third person, fourth person. But he told it from the point of view of the um, family members. You know, like I, I would want something like that for my 83-year-old father. And, and so he told a story that's, that would appeal to the person who would be the decision maker to make the purchase of that device, because it's quite possible that the person who needs it most, that's not something they would know to get. So the way that story uh, was crafted is very powerful. Yeah, I like it. Uh, looking back, back at the chat, Adrian is suggesting a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Awesome read. I definitely agree with that. Uh, not only does it teach you the communication or people principles, but uh, it also helps you expand your vocabulary and language. Uh, Adrian has another question. Oh, good. I got my chat to work too. Rachel wrote, Rachel Lee wrote about sometimes charisma comes with being lively and animated. Is that something that's best to be toned down? Um, your animation should be appropriate to the story, the emotions in the story. There's nothing quite like you're telling a sad story with a smile on your face. You just want to be congruent. If you be in it and feel it as you tell it, all this will work itself out. Go ahead, Chen. I, I, oh, no. I stopped you. Uh, just another comment from Adrian. Um, Asking more questions and more listening, uh, he's found that it helps him slow down the conversation and communicate more calmly. Great, nice. Uh, I have one question, and then per perhaps I think we can wrap up the session after that. Um, okay. That's the other questions. Um, what I find challenging is when I tell stories, I struggle with kind of making it the right length. So in certain cases, like I have this very interesting story, really interesting experience to share, but I might go too deep in the zoom in process and I elaborate too much, mm -hmm. or I don't know where to start or where to, like, where should I start? Should I start at the very beginning? Should I start in the middle? Yeah. Yeah. Any tips around that? 
Yeah, so my tip, my tip around that is the bare essentials are the turning point. What are you feeling and what's the problem that leads to a decision and an action? That's the moment, okay? So the essential stuff is what people need to know to understand that moment. Everything else is kind of fluff. So, so the first thing is just to be really clear about the moment and the feelings and the decisions and the actions. That's the, the critical stuff. Then you can layer in sensory things, textures, smells, other, other things that you might need. Then if you, like I said, crazy as it sounds, it's such a simple thing. If you tell your story to your phone and you create a one to four minute story, you'll know how exactly how long it is. So, so if you say, gosh, I've got a story, but it's 10 minutes and I wish it was two minutes, focus in on what's the absolute core stuff you have to have and then tell it to your phone and see if you can, if you can whittle it down. Does that make sense? Yep. If you do that, it'll bring your word count. Most people who tell engaging stories will come in at about a hundred words a minute. People who type their stories sometimes make them really long. People who tell their stories, they seem to get better at um, chunking them into, into the right size. So if you're doing a 20 minute presentation, you probably only want a little story at the beginning, kind of a catch up in the middle, kind of a tie up at the end, and then lots of technical stuff in between. So story length really matters. It's a great point. Great. Uh, thanks for the tips. I think um, I can wrap it up if there are not, uh, if there aren't any other questions.